Welcome to another episode of Jamming with Jason. Hey, today I have back Dr. Glenn Tepersky. Woohoo! It's a little, still a little early in the morning for me um, to talk a little bit more about his new book, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams. And if you've listened before, you've you've heard Gleb on here before. He does some serious research on these topics. And so again, I've been talking to you about some of this stuff already, but I'm excited to have Gleb here with me because he's done the research, he's got the numbers. And so this is how to lead a hybrid and remote team. So with that, let's roll that episode. Thank you for inviting me on, John, Jason. I appreciate it. It's good to be back. I know. Well, it's, it's um, you know, when you reached out, it was like, oh, okay. You know, because I think before we talked about cognitive biases, which are a big thing that a lot of people that I talk to have. I think we're going to talk a little bit about some of them today yep. again. But, you know, I know this whole idea of returning to the office. What does that look like? You know, do we allow people to work remotely 100% of the time? Do we do hybrid? Do we force everybody to come back into the office? As a leader, how am I going to have to be different, right? Because I think that's what's scaring a lot of people. Oh, yeah. And so, you know, I'm, I'm excited to have you here because, like I said, you've, you've gone through, you've done a bunch of research, you just came out with a new book, and we'll make sure and have that link down below. So returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams and the link to that book on Amazon will be down below as well. But, you know, let's let's just jump in and kind of start talking about it, right? Because I know I've read a lot of things. I've heard things anecdotally. People that I coach and that are in my programs are asking me about this, mm -hmm. right? So so what are you seeing? What's what's the, the landscape that's really out there as far as what this is? Is it a big deal? How do we deal with it? What really is the path? going forward when it comes to a return to office? That's clearly a big deal. I mean, we're seeing trillion dollar companies and we don't have that many <laughs> making yeah. huge mistakes in this topic. I mean, look what happened with Google. Google was for many months saying that they'll get all their employees back to their original offices. Saying that, saying that, saying that. And my internal sources of Google are telling me that you know there's a lot of opposition, internal opposition, there's kind of turnover, people leaving. And on May 5th, after saying for many months, we'll get everyone back to their original offices, Google backtracked, said, you know, we screwed up. Now we'll allow up to 20% of our workforce to work remotely, and the other 20 another 20% will work from any office they want, and 60% will come in on a hybrid schedule, maybe one to three days a week. So what happened there? Google lost a lot of top talent. It lost a lot of morale, it lost a lot of PR credibility, and it had to change a lot of its plans. Obviously, it was planning to return back to the office. That cost Google many millions of dollars, many, many millions of dollars. Mm -hmm. Funny thing is, about a month after that, on June 10th, Amazon said the same things for the same reasons. <laughs> so again, <laughs> turnover, you know, all of this stuff, <laughs> PR hit, morale and engagement hit, and having to change their plans. Again, many millions of dollars. Now, from internal information from Apple, Apple employees are kind of rebelling against Apple's plan to bring them all back to the office. And uh, have, there are lots of folks leaving. There's even public discord, which is pretty rare for Apple, but they're yeah. publicly coming out and this is saying this is a serious issue. And of course, smaller companies, you know, companies as small as Uber <laughs> have announced the same sort of things. And this is happening across, I'm just naming big, big, well-known companies. Lots of middle market companies, lots of smaller companies, the same thing is happening. And we're seeing that leaders are fundamentally at the top levels. I mean, you don't get much higher than Google and Amazon. These are you know, the trillion dollar behemoths, right? And they are fundamentally screwing up the return to the office, fundamentally screwing up the future of work. So if they're fundamentally screwing it up, <laughs> we're seeing so many other folks fundamentally screwing it up. And so yeah, if, yeah, if it's affecting them, it's affecting most every other business as well. Exactly. I was uh, doing some work for based on my book. So my book came out for returning to office and leading hybrid and remote teams and an organization uh, of peer executives uh, approached me. And this is an organization. So the national chapter, the national version of this organization which has local chapters around the world, especially in the US and Canada, many, many thousands of peer executives. 
that are, have chairs managing those groups. And they asked me to help them with the return to the office for their executives. And one of the first things I asked, well, have your executives done evaluation surveys of their employees and what they want in returning to the office? And then they put that into their survey to survey their executives. And they found out that only 44% of middle market companies ranging from 10 to you know, 3,000 people, that's kind of the level we're talking about, did surveys. 44% asked their employees what, what their they... employees want in permanent post-pandemic work arrangements and returning to the office. You know, how pathetic is that? How sad is that? And that's what we're seeing across the board. Well, really we... bad decision-making even at the stage of information gathering. So I'll talk about cognitive biases a little later, but here we're seeing really bad decision-making at the stage of information gathering. It's kind of, so there are a number of cognitive biases involved. I'll talk about a couple of them, but this, this is what we're seeing. Kind of, we're seeing people fail to gather data. Now what's happening here? And we can talk about the actual data. So there's a lot of external data about what employees want, but the cognitive biases involved here, there are a couple of cognitive biases involved in failing to gather good data. One of these cognitive biases is called the false consensus effect. Now, cognitive biases, for those who checked out my previous episode with Jason, and if you haven't, make sure to go back to listen to this previous episode. Cognitive biases are the dangerous judgment errors we make because of how our brain is wired. Our brain, our intuitions, our gut reactions, we're told to go with our gut. That's a really bad idea because our gut is wired for the savanna environment, not the modern world. In the Savannah environment, we lived in small tribes of 50 people to 150 people. And we had to rely on very quick snap judgments, the fight or flight response, also known as the saber tooth tiger response. We had to jump at 100 shadows to get away from that one saber tooth tiger. That was great for the Savannah environment, not very good for the modern environment. So right now with tribalism is a fundamental issue here. But one of the cognitive biases that comes from that evolutionary bad pattern, mental patterns is called the false consensus effect. The false consensus effect. It's where we believe that those people who are part of our tribe share our values and predispositions. And so the leaders at the top of, whether it's you know, Google or you know, mom and pop hundred people manufacturing company, those are the, they believe, they feel, their gut intuition tells them that their employees have similar beliefs to them. And even if those employees kind of say that, well, I prefer to stay at home, the people at the top still feel that these employees, you know, once they start the coming in, that they'll come in, they'll forget about their desire to stay at home. That's the feeling of the top leaders and leaders tend to go with their gut, tend to follow their intuition because that's what they're told by top gurus like Tony Robbins, who tells you to be primal, be savage, you know, go with your intuition. That's really bad advice because we're seeing cl very clearly from the top organizations, from uh, Amazon, from Google, from Apple, from Uber, from so many other companies that employees are resigning in mass and employee engagement is taking a huge hit. It's costing companies billions of dollars to their bottom lines. So this is a huge, huge problem. So that's kind of one dimension, the false consensus effect. Another one is how information is gathered. I mentioned that only 44% of these CEOs gathered information from their employees through surveys. What they did do, they, the ones who didn't gather employee information, and this is from my conversations with folks, is overwhelmingly the CEO talked to the C-suite so the you know, chief technology officer, chief auditing officer, chief risk officer, chief operations officer, chief human resources officer. And then those folks talk to their senior VPs and that's all. So think about this. These are people who had the same sort of personality career wise. They spent 30 years, they're, six, they're leaders, they have long careers. They spent 30 years in in-office environments. They're successful because of these in-office environments. They're used to them. That's what they're comfortable in. So they tell the leader, the CEO, what they feel that, yes, we need to go back to the office. This is the right thing to do. And this is cognitive bias. It's called the confirmation bias, where we look for information that confirms our beliefs and ignore information that doesn't. So this is the false consensus effect and the confirmation bias are two really big problems in how we gather information about going to the office and making the right decisions about post-pandemic work arrangements. And this is separate from that, what the actual data shows, but I want to get awareness of the cognitive biases out there. Well, yeah, because it seems like, I mean, at the, at the top, we have a, a huge disconnect, you know, and I used to find this a lot 
when I would do different surveys in companies, usually around ethics and compliance kind of stuff. But what the top leadership thought or what their beliefs were was usually dramatically different from the rest of the organization. And so there's this huge disconnect, right? And so I, I think I, I saw some of this and you're gonna know the numbers better than me, obviously from doing all the research, but, but I wanna say it was something that I read showed that, that it's 70 to 80% of CEOs at first said, nope, we're all coming back into the office, right? Because like you said, they've got that false consensus effect. They've got their confirmation bias. It says, no, this is how we've done business. This is how we're going to continue do, to do business. This is how I'm comfortable yeah. being a leader, right? And so that was their perception, but the employees completely different, yeah. right, on their take. And so that's why, again, some of these huge companies, especially those CEOs that said something early on, yeah. are having to go back and eat their words yes. at this point and say, Mia culpa, I was wrong, right? We're, <laughs> we're going to do something. And so I know that, you know, one of the first parts in the book talks about what employees really want. And to me, this is one of the most fascinating things, because like you said, a lot of people are starting to leave yeah. these organizations, right? And so it's, it's you know, leadership tip, everybody, right? If you're a leader, <laughs> easiest thing to do is actually ask your employees what they yeah. want, right? Because, yeah. oh my gosh, imagine that, right? That we actually get feedback from our employees. So so what, what is the research kind of saying? What do employees actually want? Because I think we're going to see how this, you know, ties into how these things are unfolding for us as well. Yes. So asking employees what they want is very important. And like I mentioned, only 40 to 40% 40 of CEOs did so, but also you want to think about how you ask. Some companies, and I saw this as a literal question is, how excited are you about going back to the office? <laughs> <laughs> not at all, right? <laughs> right. This is not the kind of, this is an obviously very loaded question that employees are not going to be willing to answer honestly. So in my book, uh, Returning to the Office and Leading Hybrid and Remote Teams in the Appendix, I have a survey questionnaire that you can adapt for yourself, for your company, for doing that. But you want to be thinking about how you ask. Don't ask them in a loaded manner that will clearly bias the answer. So that's kind of the first thing I wanted to mention. But let's go to the data. So where's this data coming from? It's coming from a meta-analysis I did, which is an analysis of a number of surveys, research surveys, of what employees actually want. And these surveys are coming from organizations like the Harvard Business School, obviously prestigious independent, Society for Human Resource Management, so very autonomous, you know, no stick in the game, Microsoft, so which is really helpful because it has internal data from Microsoft Teams of how people work and also from LinkedIn, because Microsoft owns LinkedIn, of how what people are intending to do, what kind of, you know, leaving their positions, looking for new positions. So that that is the kind of surveys I'm talking about. So meta-analysis of these eight surveys shows that over two thirds of all employees who worked remotely in the pandemic, the, the, this is the people are focusing on. And of course, about 50% of all employees were able to work remotely during the pandemic. So office workers of various sorts. Over two thirds of these folks want and expect to work from home half the time or more permanently. So this is over that amount. Usually from in most surveys, it's kind of over 80%. Some of the surveys are a little lower. So 70 to 80% of them want to work from home half, at least half the time or more per permanently. Anywhere from a quarter to a third want to work remotely full time. So only something like 20% want to go back to the office, 15 to 20% want to go back to the office Monday through Friday, nine to five. This is employees. Interestingly, depending on the survey, and this was from the Society for Human Resource Management, this uh, is something that they have no stake in whether people are going back in the office or not, or just managing the human resources. What the survey showed there, one of the questions is that about 50%, I think it was actually 55% in that survey, showed that people would be willing to look for a new job if they weren't given the option of sufficient flexibility, but the kind of flexibility they want in their job. So this is really serious. So then we know that most employees see teleworking flexibility as a key benefit. 
So from the surveys, they're seeing telework, saying that this telework, work from home, flexibility of their work schedules is very, very, very important to them. And on average, they would be willing to sacrifice, and this is across all surveys, 8% of their earnings to have the kind of schedule that they want. And of course, people who want to work full-time remotely would be willing to sacrifice even more of their salary. So we're seeing very, people are willing to put their, uh, you know, the, the money where their mouth is. So they're willing to give up quite a bit of money. <coughs> now, no, no, uh, well, I was, I was just going to interject there because as you're throwing those numbers out, right? So again, I mean, these are big numbers. It's lots of people. Yes. They're willing to take lower salaries. So any of you CFOs that are listening, don't think of, the, of this as a way to start trying to cut your costs either, right? You're, you're already going to cut your costs by having lower offices. So don't go through mm -hmm. and think you're going to just slash everybody's salary as a result of this. But, right. but it, it, it just shows, that's a data point that shows mm -hmm. how serious people are about this. Yes. Right. Because, and this isn't something that it's like, oh, it'd be nice. Right. I mean, people are literally over 50% or 50% of people are willing to quit their job mm -hmm. if you don't let them work from home or give them some flexible arrangement. Right. Yes. You know, all these people that are willing to take a, a pay cut, you know, in order to be able to do that. So it, it's not just a nice to have thing. I mm. mean, this is something that's like serious that you got to pay attention to because your employees are serious about this. So. Just wanted to kind of emphasize that again and, and not have people think, oh, great. Now I can I can cut my payroll costs by 8%. No, well, don't be a dick to your employees, right? Yes. But it just, it should show you how important this is to people. Right, where this becomes relevant is in the things you shouldn't, you certainly shouldn't cut current, current employee salaries, but it, you want to be thinking about this in future bonuses and you can be very explicit that saying, well, people who work full-time remotely should expect to get less uh, salary increases and should not get the same cost of living increases if they moved. So this is where you wanna be thinking. You also wanna be thinking in future hires for people who are, who, who are resigning from companies like Google and Amazon and so many other companies. You will be able to get them at a lower rate of the, if you offer them substantial flexibility and especially fully remote work, you know, other sorts of flexibility, you will be able to get them at a much lower. I mean, imagine if somebody, you know, uh, Google, if you need some talented tech people and the Google engineer moved to Montana and would like to live in the middle of rural Montana, the salary that they would request, that they would like, would be much smaller than uh, if they lived in Silicon Valley and came to the office. Yep. So that's the kind of things you want to be thinking about when you're thinking about cost savings. Mm -hmm. Well, good point. Well, and so, you know, I know we talked, we already talked about a couple of um, confirmation biases that the leaders have, but I know there was another one that we talked about before we started hitting hit record here too, that I think, you know, around kind of this illusion of control mm -hmm sort of thing too that i think yes. is is important here again you know for the leaders to be thinking about so yes. it's a big deal your employees want it there can be some cost savings you know like you said if somebody chooses to move to montana well great maybe i don't need to pay them one hundred and fifty thousand dollars now like i did in silicon valley maybe i can pay them 120 or 100 they still have a better quality of life mm -hmm. right with that lower exactly. salary because they live in such a a lower cost of living place, right? So there are some opportunities there. Plus, they're gonna they're gonna be happier, right? Mm -hmm. But you know, I know that you know. Let, let, I just wanted to talk about illusion of control a yeah, little bit because let, let, because I think this is one as I've talked to leaders that they they feel like they can control and they can put their thumb on people and feel like they're really in control, but are they really? And I'm, I'm guessing the answer is no, because it's a cognitive bias and it's called illusion That's of right. control, right? Yes. So what, what, what does that mean? Because again, a lot of the people who are leaders listening to this are probably going to be like, I don't, I don't have that. Well, you probably do. So pay attention, okay? Yep. And this has to do with productivity. So let's, so prepositioning this by the data on productivity. People in the surveys report that they're much more productive 
over 75%, 75 to 80% report that they're equally or more productive working remotely than working in the office. And that's kind of their self-reporting. We also have data from internal data from Slack and from Microsoft Teams that they're more productive when they're working from home than when they're working from the office. We also have peer reviewed data from a number of individual studies looking at productivity in certain companies, showing that people are more productive at home than they are in the office, which is you know, not surprising when you think about it because in the home, they don't have nearly as many distractions as they have in the office. That's kind of one really nice thing. They can set up their environment to be maximally comfortable rather than you know, the environment that they have to put up with in the office. And they also don't have to face the commute, you know, an hour there in traffic and an hour there back of unpaid labor. This is one of the reasons, you know, this combination of reasons, especially the last one, people, that's one of the biggest complaints. Uh, in fact, I think commuting is the biggest complaint people have about returning to the office and unpaid labor that they do in commuting. <laughs> yes. And so they overall work 20 hours more per month if they work full-time remotely. Mm -hmm. And so their productivity overall is 10 to 14% greater if they work remotely. That's the productivity, and especially in their individual tasks. We can talk about separately and their collaborative tasks. There's some uh, more ambiguity there, but in their individual tasks, they're incredibly more productive in, if they work at home. Now, springing from that, leaders tend to feel that once somebody, that they really like seeing people in the office because they feel like they have oversight over these people. They can go around, they can see these people working, they can see these people engaging. And that's what leaders tend to feel that makes them very comfortable in their gut, you know, talking about their gut reactions, intuitions, their gut tells them that that's the right way of working, where they can go around and check in on people, check out what people are doing, that's what they feel. Now, unfortunately, when we look at actual observational studies of what happens in the workplace, you know, the Monday through Friday, nine to five, somebody's there for you know, 40 hours, you know, lunch hour for an, you know, an hour, so 35 hours. How much time do they actually spend working is the question. When we look at their actual observational studies of how much time people spend working, it's less than 20 hours, less than 20 hours. Why is that? Well, when you as the big boss are coming by, of course they perform working. Of course they quickly you know, go and you know, go to the spreadsheet and do look like they're working. But the reality of how they spend their time, plenty of time is spent on personal. There's a reason that Amazon gets most of its business during the workday. Because <laughs> <laughs> people are shopping when they're supposed to be working, exactly, right? Exactly. Yeah. Social media, you know, all of this other stuff. People spend their time distracted on social media and all of these other things when they are supposed to be quote unquote working. And so this is a huge fundamental misconception and blind spot called the illusion of control, where people, especially people in leadership positions, but all of us have an illusion that we are in control of more things than we actually are especially of other people, but our environment as well, we actually have much less control than we tend to feel we do. And leaders have much less control over their employees than they tend to feel they do. And if the leaders try to exert more control, employees often feel resentful and often act out, often try to undermine this control. And any experienced leader, I'm sure, knows some stories, examples of this sort of thing happening where you're trying to force someone and the uh, employees kind of you know, back lashing out against you because of that. This is a big problem, this illusion of control that causes leaders to want their employees to go back to the office, whereas the simple, fundamental, completely counterintuitive reality is that employees are much more productive if they're at home. And do you, as a leader, do you care about them being in the office or do you care about them being productive? Do you care about your personal comfort and gut reactions and feeling that this is the right way of doing things? Or do you care about how much they're producing for the company's bottom line? So this is a fundamental issue that's going on. This illusion of control, it combines with another cognitive bias I want to highlight called the status quo bias. The status quo bias that relates to us wanting to get back to what we feel is the right status quo. And leaders feel that January 2020 is the right status quo, that that was the right environment that felt good to them, 
they felt in their gut reactions that that was the right thing to do, the right way to work together. And they're trying to just turn back the clock. And it's kind of a natural, under, understandable feeling. We want to turn back the clock. We want to go back to those idyllic days before the pandemic. And you know what? We'll never go back to January 2020. I hate to disappoint you, but we'll never go back to January 2020. The pandemic has fundamentally disrupted our reality and shifted the perceptions of employees who now know, very comfortably know, that they can get their work done completely remotely, fully remotely. They can, they've spent over a year doing their work fully remotely. They know they can do it. And that there is no reason for them to do the unpaid labor of going on the commute. And there is no reason for them to, you know, put their fake smiles on when they greet their colleagues. <laughs> and so many people do. And I've heard so many complaints from employees. Of course, some people genuinely want to see their teammates, but the plenty that I've seen and I've talked to really are putting on fake smiles. This is especially applicable, and this is really important. I want you to pay attention to diversity and inclusion. Diversity and inclusion. When we look at surveys, so there was a survey of knowledge workers, specifically of uh, office knowledge workers, you know, everyone from tech to auditors to people who have expertise, professional expertise. And what it found was that knowledge workers, out of all knowledge workers, when you look at the statistics, 20% of white knowledge workers want to go back to the office full-time Monday for Friday, nine to five. So 80% don't, that's 20% of them do. When you look at black knowledge workers, only 3% of them want to go back to the office full-time. 3%, why is that? When they're doing in-depth interviews with those folks, the answer is that they face, every day they face microaggressions, discrimination in the office. They feel those microaggressions that they face. And this applies not simply to black, but to people who with disabilities, to people with various categories of discrimination who are facing discrimination. And over this year that they've been working, over a year that they've been working full-time remotely, they have faced much less discrimination. There's still, there's still some digital discrimination and bullying going on, especially with being interrupted during the meetings when people in minority positions tend to be interrupted more, but it overall was much better for minorities. So for diversity inclusion, whether it's black people, Hispanic people, people with disabilities, it has equalized them to their white male colleagues because you know you just see those faces on Zoom screen and oftentimes people don't show their faces. So it's much more equal and there's much less discrimination and that helps people have a much better experience and perform much better. So if you're forcing people to go back to the office, you're discriminating against people who are in minority positions and you'll have a lot more of them leaving, which is another reason that Amazon, Google and Uber have reversed their policies because they've seen especially lots of black and other minority tech talent leaving. And I can guarantee you if you're forcing people back to the office, you're gonna see more minorities leaving than you'll see white people. So you'll become as a workforce less oriented toward diversity and inclusion. Well, so I just wanna recap a couple of those things that you just said, because they're important and I want people to make sure they get it, right? Is forcing people back into the office is actually more discriminatory too. I mean, you, those numbers are pretty appalling, yes. right? That, that forcing people back is actually discriminating more against minorities or even, you know, like you said, people maybe with physical challenges or other things like that. Allowing them to work remotely is more inclusive. It's more even in a, from a playing field standpoint for everybody. And we've proven that people can actually get their work done, right? And then back to, back to the, you know, the thing about the illusion of control that I wanted to bring up because I, I don't want people to have skipped over to this because you, you threw out some numbers there that are pretty huge, which is, you know, if you're one of those leaders that think that feels like you have control and you have to have them there so you can walk around like you're the foreman in the, in the, mach in the factory with the whip, cracking the whip <laughs> on them to make sure that people are doing their job, right? If that's the kind of person you are, and what we've seen before is you're lucky to get 20 hours of work a week out of those employees that are managed that way. Now, if you let them work from home, you're gonna get, if you, if you only get 20 hours of work out of them, 
you're getting more productivity than you had when they were in the office. Plus the people who are working from home are more efficient. And I think I heard you say that they're actually working 20 hours a month more. That's right. Yep. They're working than they were hours. in the office. So it's That's like, right. holy shit. I mean, all of a sudden you're getting a double whammy, right? They're actually mm -hmm. giving you more hours. They're more productive in those hours as well. So you don't have to be standing over somebody cracking the whip for them <laughs> to be productive. In fact, if you're that kind of leader, you're probably getting less productivity out of your mm -hmm. workers than you should be. And you're the problem. So quit doing it. Let them, <laughs> let them work from home. Right. Yep. Um, so, so let's, let's go, you know, cause I, I know I could, I can geek out on this stuff and just keep going and going and going, but you know, the, 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 the last, you know, part here to try to wrap up what we can. And again, go out and get Gleb's book because all the information is here for you folks. Okay. But, um, you know, there, there still seems to be the debate. Well, in, in office, fully remote, hybrid, what's really the answer, right? Because again, we've got a lot of people that are taking sides in this, lots of people that think they're right. But what's, what's really the practical long-term solution? Because like you said, we're never going back to January, no. 2020 normal. So no. what is the future gonna actually look like? So looking at the practical solution, you wanna look at the company's bottom line and how people are most productive and what's going to be the best for your company and for your you know, nonprofit or municipality if you work there. So thinking of that, what the research shows is the best approach is a team-led hybrid model with some fully remote options. Here's why. You, you as the CEO, top leader, chief auditing officer, chief risk officer, you should establish broad guidelines for everyone, but you should let the lower level team leaders decide what's best for their teams because they know best what's going on on the ground level and how their team functions. But the criteria you need to set, you need to set broad criteria for them. So something like the companies I've worked with, I've worked with 12 companies to help them adapt to the post pandemic normal, kind of the post COVID work arrangements, permanent work arrangements, the future of work. And the what they did overwhelmingly is set a guidelines of mostly hybrid workforce, one to three days a week in the office. And then the some proportion, 10 to 30% working full-time remotely. So that's what they said. And here, here's the reasoning. You want to make sure that the people who are working in the office, that there's a reason for them to come to the office. Why the heck should they go for the commute? Why are they coming there? You know, if they're going on the commute, I can guarantee to you that they're spending less time. And we have extensive research proving this that people, when they go on the commute, they feel like they're working they're, and they're actually work, going to work less time for you. So you need to have a reason for them to come into the office. The only reason for people to come into the office is to do collaborative tasks. Because collaborative tasks, some collaborative tasks, especially the more intense ones, are better done in the office for most people, not all. So collaborative tasks. So you want to look at collaborative tasks for them to do. Now there's some benefit to team culture to coming into the offices as well one day a week or something or one day every couple of weeks. But the crucial thing that you that the from the reasoning of the company is making is their collaborative tasks. Now, if the people are not doing, if it's just a team where everyone is doing their own individual thing, like salespeople, then uh, they're, they're not collaborating together. They don't need to come into the office. There's absolutely no reason for them to come to the office. If they are collaborating together and if they need to work things out, then there's a reason for them to come into the office. So that's kind of the one to three day a week. And the team leaders should make decisions based on that principle with the caveat that if they have team members who are quite successful at working individually, at, uh, who are quite successful at working full-time remotely, and if they the team members really want to work full-time remotely to encourage the team leaders to allow those team members to work full-time remotely because otherwise you're likely to lose them. So unless you're come, unless they have to do a lot of intense collaborative work together, strongly encourage team leaders to allow those folks to work full-time remotely. So that's the breakdown and you'll get that sort of breakdown. And that's what we've seen a number of successful companies like 
Target and so on that are returning people there, re that are returning people to the office and those dynamics. And some companies like Nationwide, I mean, Nationwide is a huge insurance company. It's founded very old, very traditional, founded in 1926. Some of the departments in Nationwide are permanent post-pandemic work arrangements. 75% of the workforce is working full-time remotely. So it's just, uh, you know, this is not only tech companies, this is all sort of company, all sorts of companies. So once you have those decisions, what you want to do is think about what your office will look like. Your office should not look like the previous office that it was because people are in the office will be working overwhelmingly on collaborative tasks, not their individual tasks. They will not need their individual cubicles because they'll, they, they won't be working on their individual tasks. You, you, you wanna set up some kind of hot desking so that people in between their meetings with team members can pop in and you know, work for an hour or two. But they really won't be, you know, if the if most people, what will happen is that they'll come in for half a day on to meet with their team and do some collaborative work mm -hmm. and go home, not doing any of their individual work in the office. They'll just be doing their individual work at home. So that's going to be important for you to revise your office space to be much more collaboratively oriented from what's previously the usual orientation is 80% personal space and 20% collaborative. It should be reversed around 20% personal space. You know, some offices left for top leaders who for leaders who need to have closed door meetings, private meetings, and the rest should be a little bit of hot desking sort of arrangements. The rest should be conference rooms with good video technology equipment and informal lounge spaces for people to collaborate together. And also, so once you look at how much, how many people are coming in, if you're seeing that, let's say on average, you have people coming in one day a week. You know, some people working full-time remotely, some people coming in two days a week, on average, one day a week. That means your occupancy for the office is going to be much less than pre-pandemic. <laughs> so this is a wonderful opportunity for you to save on real estate costs and pretty huge savings. You probably need something like 10 to 30% of your real estate just for fundamental things like offices, accounting, start stuff like that. The rest of it, 80% or so, is based on occupancy. And if you have your occupancy is 20% of what it was prior to the pandemic, you can probably get rid of most of that office space, maybe keep 40% of what you had before the pandemic. And that will be a great cost savings for you, which you should use to help employees fund their home offices. Because I can tell you, a lot of people don't have a good home office setup. They have, you know, their, maybe their laptop is good enough but their microphones are bad, their video cameras are bad, their lighting is bad, they have not ergonomic furniture. This is permanent stuff. They're permanently going to be working you know, four and a half days for home if they're coming in hybrid one day, half day a week. And you, know, you have 20% of them who are working full-time remotely. You wanna set up them in comfortable offices to maximize their productivity. And remember, you know, ergonomic furniture helps them, but video cameras, microphones, help their team members. So you want to help their team members be effective communicators. So that's really important. And we're talking about productivity. Something that's really critical here is to change your performance evaluation system. So this is really important. If you want to make sure that people, that you adapt successfully to a hybrid first model with some fully remote options, that means that your productivity should not be based on how much time you see somebody working, which is honestly the typical way that people evaluate in those quarterly or even the one time big annual performance evaluation. You want to change that, change that from based on amount of time spent working and observed working to deliverables. What kind of deliverables is somebody doing? What kind of accomplishments do they have? And instead of having that quarterly or annual performance evaluation, deliverables based performance evaluation should be done every week where every week you have a brief meeting as a, the team leader has a brief meeting with the team members, 15 to 30 minutes, where the team member sends in advance a brief report, you know, a couple of paragraphs and their top accomplishments, three to five top accomplishments, challenges they faced, how they solved them, their plans for next week's top accomplishments, and then a self-evaluation. And the leader then meets with them and talks about the accomplishments, maybe coaches them on solving problems better, agrees or revises on next week's activities, and then agrees or revises their performance evaluation, uh, their self-evaluation, which all gets fed back into a continuous promotion and evaluation system. 
And that is a much, much better way of evaluating people's performance in our new normal that's going to be hybrid first. Mm -hmm. Well, yeah, because you're, you're right. It's, it's the, um, th there's a lot of stuff to consider here, right? And, and, you know, going, because I know one of the questions that a lot of times leaders will ask me is, well, how do I manage my staff at this point, right? And yeah, you know, typically we've done, you know, quarterly evaluations, you know, and this, you know, switching to something like weekly performance evaluations is much better, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and, and again, I mean, there's, there's been companies that have been doing this for a long time. That's how they, that's how they do it, right? I mean, you, you have to be intentional as a leader, which means you're probably going to have some standing meetings once a week, you know, maybe short meetings, maybe they're only 15 minutes mm -hmm. with each of your people, but that way there's a check-in, right? And, and again, like you said, we've got to probably change what it means to perform, Yes. right? Hours in the office isn't the best way to determine whether somebody's productive. It's more about output. Mm -hmm. So we're going to have to be a little a little, um, you know, innovative and in thinking about, well, what, how can we measure output? Because again, I know some jobs is going to be harder to know how can I, you know, evaluate their output, mm -hmm. uh, but it's something that we got to do. And I, and I think, you know, again, you didn't hit on this directly, but you know, the whole idea too, I think that if, if, and again, like you said, most companies are probably going to go to a hybrid with some people being allowed to completely or full-time work from home. So again, you just want to be careful that we're not being discriminatory or exclusive to certain people as well, right? Is that don't let some of your cognitive biases come in of out of sight, out of mind. I never see them. I don't joke with them. So they must not be performing as well, mm -hmm. right? And really be clear on there's no preferential treatment. You know, people that come into the office full time or that come in part time, they're not necessarily doing a better job, you know, because, again, this could open you up to some huge discrimination suits <laughs> going forward, especially if the data shows that people who come into the office on average get better performance evaluations than those who who choose not to. Right. Because, again, there may be that one of those unconscious biases that you could be discriminating against people, not because of the color of their skin or religion or ethnic background, but, you know, the choice that they have of not wanting to come into the office. And that makes them a little bit different than the people who are there that you might think are the team players because they're coming in, right? So again, you got to be, care be careful of that as well. That I think that's, that's one of those, there's going to be a lot of work in trying to come up with new ways of kind of calculating and tracking performance. Uh, You're absolutely right. And that's specifically why the performance evaluation needs to be weekly and needs to be based on accomplishments. Because it's very clear for the leader, okay, here are the agreed upon accomplishments. Because each week you agree with the team member what her or his accomplishments will be for the subsequent one week. Then you could see that they perform, how well they perform on these accomplishments. And then there's an evaluation of their performance, which you discuss with them and you coach them on how to do better if they need it. So that equalizes the situation for everyone who is coming in or not coming in. And then you can easily track and see whether someone is doing better in their performance, but they're not getting as good evaluations. Well, that's a serious problem. And yeah. so that is addresses the problem by having that performance evaluation system set up effectively. Yeah. No, this is really good, good stuff. Glad. Thank you for coming on and sharing because I know, you know, like I said, I've, I've been seeing some of this stuff anecdotally. So it's nice to now have, you know, your analysis and, and information from these studies that show this is really what's happening. Yeah. This really is a big issue. <laughs> you know, you got to do it and you got to figure out how to get it done. So, so yeah, go out, get, get Gleb's book, returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams. It's going to give you a lot of information um, about it. And obviously I know from the sounds of it, you've been helping organizations do this too. So you mm -hmm. actually do help companies kind of navigate through this um, for them as well, because it's, it's new to all of us, right? So, yeah. so again, Absolutely. it's, 
it's don't don't get stuck in that status quo bias and think no damn it it's going to be the same way that it was just embrace the change mm -hmm. and be a leader and figure out figure out how to get it done yep you're absolutely right and we do have some experience from elsewhere in pandemic situations not in the us which is there are so there are some best practices developed which i bring into my consulting work with companies on how what are the best practices that other countries have seen on going back to the office and so we do know that there are ways of getting it done it's just that it's never happened in the us and folks don't have it as part of their background and part of their knowledge system so we know it can be done we know there are best practices we know it can be effectively accomplished but most lead the vast majority of leaders just don't have the information on the basis and that's why i wrote the book returning to the office and leading hybrid and remote teams well, thanks, Cleb. I'm sure we'll have to have you back again because I always love our conversations. Happy to. Thank you, Jason. Thanks. thanks.